Well, um, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Temba, thank you very much. It's good to see friends again, Tom Palmer, Eustace, um, Leon Lu, Baron, and uh, a host of others I haven't acknowledged. Um, my previous panel, my colleagues at the table have actually um, spoken a lot about the importance, and indeed, Tom and uh, Leon and Baron and everybody else who has had opportunity to speak about property rights have underscored the essence of respecting property rights because somehow it relates to the economic growth of any country or every country in the world. In fact, if you look at all the various economic indices, uh, clearly property rights are somehow referenced as one of the um, enablers of growth. To the extent that the recent Global Competitiveness Index has ranked South Africa, I think the current ranking is around 60, you're 61st, um, and you dropped from you dropped 14 places from the 47th position not too long ago to Sister First. And I think one of the reasons for which you dropped was because of the uncertainty of government business and grave corruption. Um, I just want to make sure if the, the other can people are the listening. Back, can you hear at the back? Pardon? You All right. Well, um, I'm a soft speaker, and I'm actually very shy as well, so maybe that's why. Let me just say that, I, I just, let me just repeat what I said. I said it's good to see friends, and uh, I was just mentioning the fact that the various economic indices of the world have all referenced property rights as a, a very important enabler of growth. And uh, the recent example I'm citing here is the Global Competitiveness Index, by the WEF, the World Economic Forum, which put South Africa, I think, 14 places worse off than the previous ranking. You were 47th not too long ago, but currently at 61st. Um, and the reasons for which you have slumped is simply because of government corruption and uncertainty in government business. And I presume that the uncertainty has to do also with the issues around land or property rights. You know, any time I've met uh, Leon Lu, he would ask me, he's so positive about Ghana, and so he normally would ask me if there's any positive news to share. Well, as far as this subject is concerned, I have, well, I have two important pieces of news. Um, one is positive politically, uh, the other not so positive. As you know, Ghana has 111 ministers of state. Um, yes, 111. In fact, we, there were 110, and then we protested. And the president did the reshuffling and added one more. Um, <laughs> what will interest you to note is that there are five ministries that are somehow related to land. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, the Minister for Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs, and yes, we do respect our chiefs a whole lot. <laughs> our chiefs are custodians of lands. Never mind, they have become very vibrant sellers of lands without uh, recourse to law. But we have a ministry for chieftaincy and religious affairs. And there's a reason why this is important, because I'll share an anecdote shortly. We have the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. Then we have the Ministry of Agri, and the Ministry of Regional Reorganization. Now, all these agencies or ministries of state are somehow actually interface with land. And there are two more agencies of uh, states that deal with land, Lands Commission and Land Valuation Board. Even though I read land economy for my first degree, because of the corruption within the sector, I decided I wouldn't be corrupted. The only reason why, even though I had a job at the Lands Commission, I turned it down. Um, I think there's still some reformation going on. The other piece of news I want to share in relation to the Ministry of Religious Affairs and Chieftaincy is that the current government is proposing a cathedral project. In fact, there's a national cathedral that is being built on prime land. And the reasons the government gives is that after 60 years of being blessed as a nation, 
as a result of independence, we need to be, we need to accord God some very good reverence. And because of that, we need to put up a cathedral on prime land, which houses very important estates in order to put up or erect this edifice called cathedral. Now, someone had said that land actually evokes a lot of sentiment and their emotional attachment. To think that people who are not directly connected in a way do not necessarily gain uh, profitably from the lands that are supposed to be or from the property that are supposed to be demolished in order to erect this cathedral are all up in arms against the government. It tells you how important the value of land is to people. Well, the president wants to go ahead, and I think they've enlisted the services of a very important architect, and he has also added his reason for which that cathedral should be put, in, um, and his reasons are simple, so that the cathedral would essentially complete the architectural uh, um, aesthetics of the city. Now, if these are reasons for which very valuable property, and I'm not saying we shouldn't worship God, but if it is the case that religion is a private affair, you would wonder why in this day and age the government of Ghana would like to, as it were, appropriate land. But there's a provision here. They are, they are going to pay compensation anyway. The only challenge is that this compensation that will be paid is not coming from their pockets. And so that is the challenge. But to build on that, you know, the sentimental nature or the sentiments attached to land are so important that in Ghana, our chiefs, as I said, are custodians of lands. In fact, in the second most important city in Ghana called Kumasi, the king there, the king of Ashanti, which I'm sure you know him, um, is said to be the custodian of all lands. So in Ashanti, they say no land is for sale unless the chief or the king actually um, blesses it. And the reasons are simple. In traditional folklore, the understanding is that the king is the embodiment of land, keeping the land on behalf of the dead, the living, and those generations yet to be born. Unfortunately, it's not every part of the country that respects this order. So as I said not long ago, chiefs are actually active participants in looting and selling lands uh, as if there's no tomorrow. But there was, it was the same sentiments that we attached to land that forced us in 1897 to actually fight the British when the British had wanted to vest all landed property, uh, forests, minerals, and all of that in the crown. And um, independence, pre-independence activists actually led a delegation to the UK and at the time protested these very, what they saw was a grave error and a grave infraction on their human rights and actually got a lands bill in 18, actually they started the, the protest in 1894, got the lands bill in 1897 passed and that's the only reason why the British did not vest landed property from Ghana into the crown. Now, you'd have thought that our socialist president in 1966, sorry, 1962, would have simply done away with all this history. But he was mindful that even though he could vest lands into, in, in, he could vest lands into the executive, there was something he did. He said even though he could appropriate lands, he made sure that the law stated clearly that people whose lands have been taken would be compensated duly. And even as far back as 1962, if your lands were appropriated and you were not satisfied with the value, you had a right to contest it at the tribunal. Um, I have to report positively though that as we speak, almost all these various pieces of legislation from 1962 up until 1999 have been have been consolidated into a State Lands Act 2016. And the same thought processes are still expressed through the Lands Act. In fact, um, we do not have words like expropriation without compensation. In fact, what we do have is temporary, um, temporary occupation of land. And in that, the government or the president, actually it doesn't even say the president, the government has the right to discuss 
with potential owners of land, the reasons for which they need those lands for public purposes. But they'll sit with them to determine the values, and if they disagree over the values, they have a right to contest it in court. This is much more decent, I think, in spite of the fact that, yes, governments may still hold sway when it comes to certain lands that they want in order to do development. Um, then fast forward, we, but there was a temporary period within which um, all of this experiences were actually expressed and the reasons for which I think we should never allow any country to toy with that example. You know, I have a PowerPoint, um, but I've said quite a lot of what I, is in the PowerPoint already and uh, I don't know how to, okay. Well, all right, I just want to jump to uh, a lot of it have been said already. Uh, just one second. All right. Okay. There was something else I found which was rather interesting while we were doing this research. The we found out that even though these, there's supposed to be an audit in South Africa to justify the EWC, according to the uh, South African Institute for Race Relations, majority of black South Africans have little interest in the land reform because 65% of the country is urbanized and preferences for jobs in towns and cities. Uh, something along the lines of what Leon Lu suggested, that we should be dealing with the value of land rather than the sentiments attached to this noise. Let me jump on to um, okay. This is rather slow. Okay. I want to jump to Ghana. Uh, oh no, what happened? Anyway, um, I'll continue. The what I wanted to share was that in the in, there was a period when we had military rule. Uh, the last military rule was between 1989 to 1992. And that was when there was a little period of madness compared, uh, as far as uh, uh, expropriating lands was concerned. But even then, they were quite uh, a bit sensible. You would have thought that the military janta would rather expropriate, appropriate lands without necessarily giving value. They had some kangaroo courts where you need to go and contest your claims, especially when it comes to what limited compensation you were going to be given. Um, but as was noted by Tony Kellick, a development economist at the time, even that period sent shivers down the spine of investors to the extent that even after military rule, we still lived with the fact that people were suspicious about our respect for property rights, and not just property rights as in landed property, but actually businesses as well. So to the extent that if you look at the data, and because this is misbehaving, partly due to my fault, I would have shown you how between 1966 and 1990, in 2001 rather, even when you'd have had situations where there are legally mandated processes to appropriate lands, what really happens is that the compensation itself it's, the compensation process itself can be very problematic. There are still 90 cases still in court, still being um, discussed. I mean, people are contending these, the various amounts that have been given them. And that's almost 30 to 40 years. So even though I've painted a very positive picture of what exists in Ghana, that even under military rule and uh, pre-colonial, colonial and military rule, you still had instances where um, people could, the state could do anything they wanted with land, and there was some semblance of compensation that was paid. But the process itself was laborious to determine how much compensation it should be paid. So the point I'm making is, even where you have a semblance of order, you still have challenges. So to move from that position to the position South Africa wants to get itself into right now, it's a complete disaster, and it could be very disastrous for the country as well. The final piece of news I've got to share is that because we learned all these lessons, our investment laws have been upgraded. By 2013, 
we decided that we're no longer going to ask people, we're not, go not going to wantonly decide that uh, if, you, if you're a foreigner and you own assets, or even you're a local and you own assets or a business, it could be nationalized. So we expand those from our books. We made sure that no part of anybody's property, be the business, would, could be nationalized or indeed appropriated in a manner that would bring on toward hardship to the individuals involved. And to that extent, I think there's been some relative calm. Uh, even though the doing business report doesn't seem to favor us so well, um, because we are currently 114, if you look at the various indicators that rank us poorly, one of it is uh, respect for property and minority rights. We are not doing so well there, um, but I think it's a matter of time. We just had a government that was clearly uh, inept, and the current government is trying to roll back even though they are still being profligate and wasteful. Um, and because of that, the, we still are not doing particularly well when it comes to um, registering the property. We, uh, Mayo, uh, we lost three, uh, we lost three places. Um, we are currently 114th on the doing business ranking report out of 190 countries. In 2015, we were 108th, 2016, we were 112. 2017, we were 120th. And uh, as I said, we are trying to claw back from the cold and moving, we've moved six places to 114. Now, what was curious was that in all of this, Somalia was a 190th country, ranked the least place to do business. But I was telling the ministers of finance and parliament on Sunday that it is important that the government respect contracts which are akin to property. Because Somalia, even though it was 190th, beat us when it comes to enforcing property. Contracts, sorry. When it comes to enforcing contracts. We were 114th, we were, they were 114th, and we were 116th. But I joked that in Somalia, the reason is possibly because they enforce contracts with guns. But, um, but these are very ominous re reasons of which I think um, we need to do more. So on the whole, this is Ghana. Um, we are nowhere near to any of the madness being talked about here. Um, but there are still significant lessons to, be, to learn. Ultimately, if you decide to do, go ahead with what you want to do as a country, you drive investors who would naturally come to Ghana. When you had Zuma, I have to share this anecdote. Uh, even though at the height of bad economic management in Ghana in 2015, I had the um, regional managers of, uh, forgotten the German pharmaceutical company that was here in South Africa, contemplating moving the uh, vaccine production house from South Africa to Ghana because they thought Ghana was a preferred business place. But we were sitting there and we, we didn't even have electricity. Uh, but it tells you something, that even if at that height of economic mismanagement, our country could be considered to be the preferred destination for business, you toy with this whole business of EWC at your own peril. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, let's, let's, let's.